record us as well. Okay, then you can record it. Yep. Okay. So I think with that, why don't why don't we go ahead and get started? So, Grandpa, I was thinking what you could do is maybe maybe uh, state your full name and your uh, your birth date. Okay. And where you were born. All right. And then we can continue to to talk and okay. See where we'll the just conversation. Carry on a normal conversation. See where the conversation takes us. Yep. Okay. That's all. I just. Pretend, pretend none of my tools and technology is here. <laughs> <laughs> okay, don't let that, don't let that pressure override you. <laughs> don't let it scare you, Grandpa. <laughs> <laughs> no panic. <laughs> okay. Okay. All right, you want me to start talking now? Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Okay, well, my name is uh, John M. Lurch. I was born in Old Wine, Iowa on April 27. 1926 at 6 p.m. in the evening. At 6 p.m. in the evening. <laughs> yeah. I don't know what my mother tells me. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I don't even know if I remember what time I was born. I know the date. I remember that much. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. That's impressive. Okay. Uh, do you want me to talk? In, in where, uh, in, in Owine, Iowa, in where where is Owine? Owine, Iowa? Iowa is a city of about six to seven thousand people. It's in Fayette County, Iowa, about forty mi or sixty miles straight north of uh, Cedar Rapids, Iowa, okay. and forty miles northwest of Waterloo, Iowa, and seventy miles east of Dubuque, Iowa, yeah. right up in the northeast corner of Iowa. Okay. Yeah. I remember that. And how long did you guys live there? Uh, I lived there uh, for my first uh, 20 years, 21st years really, after wow. I uh, went to uh, grade school and high school there. And um, then I was uh, inducted into the Army uh, in 1945. So, be so before we go too far down that hole, because yeah. I know that there's a lot of really interesting things there. Um, I, I thought I heard that your mother had a grocery store yes, business? Yes, yes. My father died when uh, my brother Bob and I were young children. I was four and uh, Bob was one. Wow. And, and uh, this was in 1930, right at the start of the Depression, when yeah. the Depression came on. And my mother operated a grocery store in uh, Old Wine. And she had a lot of very loyal customers and family and friendly neighbors and so on that gave her business and, and uh, that supported us uh, all the time up until 1942 when she became ill. Uh, the, the, the year 1942 was kind of the start of World War II and all the rationing that came in and, mm -hmm. and all of the uh, accounting she had to be responsible for for oh, ration stamps oh, yeah. and uh, giving credit to uh, the customers and so on. Yep. And uh, the, the rationing particularly, the, the whole work just became overwhelming to her uh, and she was doing it on her own. And oh it, it just kind of was overwhelming for her and she had to give it up in 1942. So she sold the grocery store? Yeah, yeah. It, it kind of liquidated on itself. Uh, okay. And uh, Old Wine being a small town, there were not a lot of buyers or anything like that. It just kind of liquidated right. on its own. And uh, she, uh, she, we had, a, it was even so far overwhelming that she had to be hospitalized for a while. It wow. was that much of a pressure on her. Uh, for about six weeks, I remember, she was down in... Uh, Iowa City at the State University of Iowa Hospital for a period of a, well, a few months to get herself straightened out and and then she came back and she was a very vibrant woman and so on. Wow. Yeah. So what did she do after the grocery store was sold? Well, uh, I was finishing high school, that was 1942, and I graduated from high school in 1944. And in that period of 42 to 44, and even up to 45, uh, we were living with our grandmother, my 
my mother's mother, Grandma Cran. Okay. Yeah, and we lived at her house. And, and that was still in Owine? Yeah, that was still in Owine, yeah, until okay. I finished high school. Then I uh, took a job after high school working on a railroad. <laughs> working on the railroad? <laughs> That's work. I don't. I don't know if I ever heard this. Yes, okay. it was. I was working on the railroad. <laughs> oh, did you work on the railroad all the live long day? <laughs> all the live long day. Uh, Casey Jones coming down the rail. <laughs> but anyway, I worked uh, in a railroad storeroom. Old Wine was a was kind of a railroad center, a central junction point for the Chicago Great Western Railroad, and. Um, I uh, worked uh, in what we called the storeroom, and uh, I had to uh, uh, fill uh, express orders for uh, all the station agents around the system because the storeroom had the supplies that they would need and so on. And I would uh, uh, gather up those supplies and package them and, and then uh, take them up to the, to the Railroad Depot where the trains came in and had them all labeled and so on where these packages were to go all around the system. And uh, the, the So you had like specific cars that you would have to put them in so well, that they would get to the right destination? No, uh, yeah, I did. Yeah. The, we'd have uh, specific cars. Uh, Owain was the center point for that railroad. And that railroad out of Owain ran to uh, St. Paul, Minnesota on the north, Omaha, Nebraska on the west, huh. and Kansas City to the south, and Chicago to the east. And it was right in the center of that railroad. And it was and this was in all their storerooms and everything right there in Owain. And this this was in Owain. Yes. Wow. It was it was Owain's biggest employer, the railroad at that day. Yeah. In those days, yeah. And I was work. I took a job in the storeroom. And uh, so, so all, uh, met all the demands for packaging and supplies that all these station agents along the system needed. Mm -hmm. Even up to 100 pound ice blocks that the, that the section gang would want. <laughs> it was a hot summer time, you know. They wanted cold water and, and we would ship out uh, cakes of ice to them uh, within a radius, you know. What? How would they ship those out? Did you put them in a, a you, you put them in a container or something? Yeah. Right? No, well, not really. No. It, it, it's odd the way that happened, but I, I know um, I would go to uh, our ice house and just take a pair of ice tongs and grab a big <laughs> chunk of ice and bring it on a baggage wagon, <laughs> get it up there, and put it on an elevator first, and then bring it up to the baggage room height, and then pull that over to the baggage room, and then take it up to the uh, to the train that was going to wow. go to the destination that uh, these workers were, and I'd have to load that cake of ice onto the baggage car. And by the time it got there, I don't know if it melted away or not, but they had some <laughs> ice. <laughs> this was hot summertime in 42, 4 and 45. <laughs> hey, your, your job wasn't to make sure that they actually got the ice. It was to, <laughs> Just load, to the sure ice, it was load, there. load the ice on the car. <laughs> yeah, that will take the hindmost. <laughs> yeah, that was it. But I, I did well, that up until I was drafted into the Army. Okay, okay. So, um, what about, uh, so I, I saw a note here from my mom that um, you spent some summers with uh, Maine and Joe? Yes. On yes. their farm? Yes. Where, uh, where was their farm at? Uh, their farm was uh, south of a little town in Iowa called Fairbank, F-A-I-R-B-A-N-K. Okay. Fairbank, Iowa, and it was a town of about six to seven hundred people. And Fairbank was about uh, oh, about nine miles from Owain. Okay. And uh, my uncle Joe and Aunt Mame had a farm three miles south of Fairbank, and they were they were.
made on, on their farm <laughs> in the summertime and did farm chores and things like that. We milked cows and how, and how how what was your youngest age that you remember doing farm chores? Uh, I I was probably about um, 1935. I remember when they bought that new car. I was nine years old. Nine, yeah. Nine years old, yeah. <coughs> and they did that up to the time I could uh, uh, carry a paper route, <laughs> and then uh, <coughs> I got a. Uh, a paper route, uh, you know, wine there, and delivered papers for money. I had to be making some kind of money all my life. Yeah. My mother was pretty poor in those days. So that she was a single mom, and she had to give up her store, and, and uh, we didn't have a lot of resources. So well, I always had to be <coughs> doing something that brought in some money, a paycheck. Well, it's. I mean, it's also. Pretty, pretty impressive that you were still able to find, find work and find some income during those, during that depression. Right, they were. Era. You bet. They were years of, uh, of, you know, where a lot of people were living in poverty. And I remember, I remember people uh, used to get receipts from the county government uh, in Iowa there. Uh, to be able to take those receipts to a grocery store and be able to buy their groceries and then the grocer would just take those receipts to the bank and uh, uh, get cash for them. And there was a lot of unemployment in those days. People did not have jobs, no jobs at all. And my mother had probably the old, one of the few telephones on the block in Owain there and it was a railroad town and different people would come over to use her phone to call up the railroad offices to see if anybody laid off or was sick or didn't mm -hmm. come to work so their husband would be able to <coughs> come to work that day. And uh, they, were, they were just kind of the side employees for the railroad. And if somebody was on vacation or took a vacation, maybe one of the neighbor people could fill his job while he was gone or yeah. something like that. Uh, they, they were tough days. People didn't have jobs, John. They didn't have jobs at all. And uh, uh, they uh, would get assistance from the county, uh, would uh, allow uh, uh, grocery credits and so on to, so they could get food and buy food with those grocery credits. So how did the grocery, do you know how the grocery credits worked? Would the county would give them something, they would take it to the store, and then the store gets reimbursed by the county? Yeah, basically. Yeah, what would happen is, is that uh, these people would apply to the county uh, for food subsistence, and uh, they would issue a voucher that would be valued at, say, 20 or $30 dollars or something, uh, a denomination thing, and then they take that voucher to the grocery store, and the grocery store would let them buy groceries up to that amount, and then the grocer <coughs> took the uh, receipts to the bank, and uh, the bank redeemed the receipts, and then of course the bank turned to the turned them over to the county for their money. Right. So and that's kind of the way the system worked. Wow. It was, it was complex, but it was necessary in those days because a lot of people just didn't have jobs at all. You know, if a, if a, if a working man in those days earned two or three or four or five dollars a day, that was something in that little town. And there was people that just earned about that kind of money. <laughs> <coughs> Unemployment was a big, big problem. Now, people that worked on the railroad, <coughs> Uh, in the shops and and uh, that the were uh, conductors and brakemen and engineers and things like that, their their pay was probably about you know eight to ten dollars a day, uh, but they only worked a forty hour week, uh, and uh, so that was kind of uh, they were they were the better jobs in that town at that time. Yeah. But the the uh, regular merchants that ran the grocery stores and the clothing stores and the hardware stores and so on, uh, their employees didn't begin to make that kind of money. Yeah. <laughs> you know? it's, it's amazing that, you know, people were able to survive and get through.
at that time. Yes, it was. Yeah, we really did. I mean, you know, you and but and, but everybody grew a garden, John, in those days. Uh, in the spring of the year, uh, April and May, uh, they'd be spading up a spot in their yard, and they would be planting potatoes and tomato plants and peas and beans and things like that. And, that would supplement a, a lot of their food costs and so on. And then if you were lucky enough to be on an acreage outside of town, which a lot of people were, if you had a couple of acres of ground, they might even have chickens for eggs and food and, and a, a much larger garden and so on. And they might even have an animal. Uh, Some uh, livestock yeah, or something. Like, yeah, they might have a cow or two for milk or something mm -hmm. like that. There were all kinds of uh, those situations. And you, your Aunt Mame and Uncle Joe, they had they had some chickens at least, right? Oh yeah, yeah, they had chickens regularly. We'd gather eggs every day, and we always had plenty of eggs and uh, things like that. And, and then uh, they'd have chicken dinners and that sort of thing. I never liked chicken because I hated to pick the chickens. <laughs> <laughs> And when you say pig chicken, <laughs> yes. just just for the right frame of reference here, you, you're exactly. talking about this is the one that's going to become the dinner. That's and I right. I have to pick exactly him up. Exactly and... right. You have to go and corner that chicken and get him and chop his head off. And then, uh, that, that is a really interesting thing about about society these days is that, that we're a little bit less connected to that food kids source, don't right? realize where their food comes right. from. Right. Well, they do. It comes from the grocery store. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. but from that, where did the grocery store get it? Yeah. Yeah. But, they didn't, but they didn't have to go to the yard and grab that chicken to turn it into a dinner. Yeah, that's right. And we used to do that. You'd grab that chicken and cut its head off and soak it in boiling water and get all the feathers off of it and so on. And, yeah. and then you'd have to gut it and... and, and uh, then it was ready to be put into the frying pan. They, I remember uh, my Aunt Mame used to uh, take all the chicken meat and, and dip it in flour and so on, so it would be nice and tasty and crickly and crackly and so on. <laughs> and, uh, uh, but I never liked chicken. <laughs> and I think that's the biggest reason I, yeah. I was always a beef guy. <laughs> you never had to yeah, kill your own cow, huh? I never had to kill a steer or a cow. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's right. So, so what is this, uh, I, I'm looking at my notes here, um, you, had, you had cousins living upstairs right. in your house too? Yeah. This is when you were still growing up then? Yes, yes. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah um, it was the Reen family, that's R-E-E-N, and um, there were seven Reen children, and uh, they lived over in Rockford, Illinois, and uh, uh, their father just couldn't get work or anything like that, and uh, he couldn't support his family. And uh, so my mother had the Reen family move to Owain. And uh, so the Reens with their seven children moved to Owain uh, and took over our upstairs uh, of our two-story home. Now, yeah. was your home separate from the grocery store? Yeah. Okay. okay. Yeah, well, it was a room in the grocery. It was a room in the uh, our home. The grocery store was a actual room in our home. Do you remember how big it was? Like was yeah. it about this yeah. size maybe? Yeah, it wasn't uh, like, it wasn't much bigger than this room you're we sitting in. There were shelves all along the walls and so on to store canned goods and display canned goods and and to display like uh, uh, oranges and apples and you know things like that. So you had, had a, a big refrigerator <coughs> for butter and milk and dairy products. Uh, we had a huge refrigerator for that, and uh, so people could come and and they'd be able to buy canned goods and dairy products, butter, milk, cheese, cold meat. My mother used to sell cold meats and so on. So you had a grocery store and two families all in the same in that house. Exactly. Wow. Yeah, that was that was those were rough depression years. Yeah, my mother was a good businesswoman. She really was. She was a she was a good businesswoman, and everybody liked her. And uh, she could 
talk with anybody, and uh, she would just she just had a, a real good personality. Uh, before she married, she was a school teacher, and uh, so were a couple of my other aunts, Mrs. Reen, and uh, uh, we always could call her Aunt Noni Cusack, and my mother. They all three of those were school uh, teachers. And they went to college over at Iowa State Teachers College in Cedar Falls. And so they taught in the country schools around Owine before they married and so on. Hmm. And, uh, but once that, the, uh, uh, the, you know, that, that part of their life was over and they settled into real life, uh, Mrs. Reen married and had this big family and, and, uh, it, it, the, the, the father just couldn't support him at all. What, support him. what do you remember about those cousins coming in and living with you? I mean, did, as kids, did you enjoy that you had more kids around that you could play with, yeah. or did it just make things a little more difficult? No, no, it was fun. Uh, it was. It was really, uh, really something. Uh, these, the ring kids were, they were, they were all nice kids. And there were five girls and two boys. And one of the boys was my age. He was six months older than me, even. So we were always in the same grades at school and so on, and, and uh, competing with each other through school. And, and then the younger Green boy, Bobby Green, I always remember what a sad day that was. Uh, <coughs> in 1936, on November 9th, I'll never forget the day. It was a Monday morning, and we had the first snowfall of the season. And uh, Bobby Reen, um, we were outside for recess at Sacred Heart School about 10 o'clock in the morning. And we were playing ball and everything like that. And it was the first snowfall. It was kind of dampish and slippery and, you know, all that sort of thing. And the ball went into the street and Bobby Reen ran out to get the ball. And a truck came along and ran right over him. Oh. <laughs> and that was a, one of the saddest days of my life, it really was, because I was more closely uh, old, associated with him than any of the other green kids, but uh, they, they were rushing to the hospital and so on, and he died about 6 o'clock that night, and I always remember that day, November 9, 1936, that uh, he died. And after being run over at school by a by a truck, and mm. it was a sad, sad day. And that was, uh, and then the Reens, uh, you know, they had nothing. They were living upstairs at our house there, mm -hmm. and, and my mother had to arrange for all the funeral and all that sort of thing. And my mother uh, had a family plot from where we buried my father, and we had to bury Bobby Green in that family plot. And uh, uh, that's where he was, till the Reens were able to get on their feet and uh, buy burial grounds on their own uh, in the cemetery there. Is, are there those plots still there today? Oh yes, they're still there today. I, every time I go back there, I visit them. In Owine? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, right there. And uh, all my... All my relatives on my mother's side are buried out there, and they were all very close, aunts and uncles, cousins, and uh, everything. And I go visit those graves every time I go to Owain. And uh, you have just a lot of memories when you walk through there. <laughs> I, I can yeah. imagine. As a little kid, yeah. Huh. That well, it's such a such an interesting life. So, so you go to high school, and then. Did you go to college and then go in the military, or was no, it military first? I'll tell you what. Um, we were living with uh, Grandma Crayon uh, when I was in my last two years of my high school. And um, I went to work on the railroad that we were talking about, mm -hmm. you know. And uh, that was a decent paycheck. And uh, I would give all the money to my mother. And um, then um, I was eventually drafted into the, into the Army in April of 1945. 
and uh, <coughs> um, we were still living up at Grandma Cran's house, and but anyway, I had to go to the army, and I was uh, inducted in the army on April fourth, nineteen forty-five, in Fort Snelling, Minnesota, and. Uh, a private's pay in those days was fifty dollars. That's all the all the private got, and that's what I was. And uh, uh, I would go up to the paymaster every payday once a month, and I'd get twelve dollars and seventy-five cents for my month's pay, and all the the rest of the money went to my mother. And then, uh, I uh, took basic training and. Camp Livingston, Louisiana, and uh, all the guys would be able to go out on Saturday night and everything, <laughs> oh, and I'd be sitting in the barracks <laughs> with my $12.75. You couldn't do much with that even in those days. <laughs> so so what did you do to pass the time then since you weren't going out? With, oh, with they, the they had PXs, or, you know, post exchanges they called them, and, and uh, you could go there and they would have... Uh, um, you know, kind of, oh, some kind of entertainment, you know, maybe the local people. Oh, like a that, local musician yeah, or something. Some musicians would come there and so on. And then they had theaters on the post, on the Army post. Oh, okay. And they would have the latest movies and all that sort of thing. And you could go to the movie and, and just things like that. So um, I never went off the post very much when I was in basic training. I was just... And how long was basic back then? Seventeen weeks. It was over four months. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, and then what was your <clears throat> what was your uh, uh, I don't I don't know back then if they just had you know infantrymen or tank men or or anything like that. Well, but I was an infantry soldier, and okay. we were being prepared for the land invasion of Japan. There's no question about that. And they would have us out in the middle of the night, uh, total darkness, crawling on our bellies with our rifles. I still remember my rifle serial number. I should have asked you. I, 3600. <laughs> I should have asked you that. Did you name your rifle? Or yeah. is that only in the Marines? That was uh, in the infantry, yeah. Okay. No, I, I never named it, yeah, but no, I, no. I remember I had an easy number to remember, and I still remember it to this day. <laughs> you always had to remember your Army serial, your army serial number mm -hmm. and your rifle number. And my rifle number was 121-3600, and, uh, <clears throat> and my Army serial number was 37793173. Those two numbers you really had to know all the time. <laughs> <laughs> but we, uh, uh, in Army basic training, they put us through all the steps of firing and, and using all the weapons, like uh, uh, the Army M1 rifle, mm -hmm. machine gun, you had to know how to operate the machine gun. Uh, we had a weapon that they called the bazooka. You had to know how to use the bazooka. And then uh, I'm trying to think of the one where you put it in the tube, the yeah, motor. And, yeah, you'd throw the shell down into the tube, and it would blast right off in front of you. Uh, we had to be acquainted and know how to use all those weapons. And, and your primary was the M1. Yeah, yeah. Okay. The M1 rifle. That was the one you always. <laughs> that was your. That was your. Bright and groom. <laughs> the M1 rifle. <laughs> now, when I was a, when I was a younger man, you had the famous story of of the mortar. Yes. Do you remember? Do you know the story I'm yes, talking I about? Do. Yes, I do. I I don't think we can get away with this interview without hearing this story. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Well, one day we were out firing the mortar, and uh, you had two men that are that man the mortar. One guy was just sitting down at the plate being sure the tube was in place and the other guy that would throw the shell down into the tube to fire off. And uh, this one And maybe just for explanation really quick in case somebody's not aware, I believe the way those mortars fire is they have a they have a device at the bottom of a it. shell, yeah. So when it when the, the mortar hits the bottom plate of yeah. that tube, it then ignites and fires it fires off. Fires it off, yes. Yeah, that's what happens. 
And uh, uh, this particular day that, uh, that we were doing this, doing mortar practice, uh, I was throwing the shoot, the, the, uh, all the device down into the tube. Yeah. And, and how long were those tubes? They were about maybe a couple feet or yeah, so? Yeah, yeah, they weren't very yeah. long. They were maybe about oh, two and a half feet long, and they fit in, and the base of the uh, tube fit into a plate, a metal plate at the ground, and it was bolted in. Okay. So there would always be a percussion when that thing would fire off, but that plate would hold that tube in place. Uh, okay. And uh, this particular day, um, as we were firing a mortar, and you were always told, never stand up when you're firing a mortar. Never stand up. And uh, so anyway, we were doing it that day, and I remember throwing down the shell into that tube, and the knock on thing didn't go off. <laughs> and geez, we stood there and stood there and waited and it didn't go off and didn't go off and like a dummy, <laughs> I stood up. And the minute I stood up, that thing went <laughs> right by my nose. <laughs> I had to change shorts, John. <laughs> You weren't wearing your brown pants that day, yeah, right? Yeah. <laughs> Unfortunately, you were wearing your whites. Yeah. <laughs> when you just went right off right in front of my face. <laughs> if I'd have been another six inches over, I wouldn't be sitting here talking to you today. And that thing just went right off on me. <laughs> but that's one the thing they always told you, never stand up when you're firing a mortar because those things happen. It seems like that's a very precarious device to be trained on because yes, if it, it because if it doesn't fire off I think what I always heard is that they tell you to unscrew the bottom right. and let the shell exactly. drop out yep. but the thing is is that that could still be a live shell at that you point you never know even it's if a you very let it risky procedure yeah what you're supposed to do is uh, yeah unscrew the base down there and gently lift the tube up and lift it up and let gravity eventually let the shell come out that's unfired. And right. uh, uh, we were, I, I just stood up, and uh, which was against the rules. I should have never done that. But fortunately, I lived to <laughs> talk about it. Did you, did you, get, did you get yelled at? I or sure did. Reprimanded yeah, I for sure, that? I got reprimanded I, very much for that. And I bet that was the last time you ever did that. <laughs> <laughs> you bet. Fortunately, I never had to use that in the real thing. But, but, uh, that was really something. Uh, that was probably the closest to death I ever came. <laughs> that thing would have blasted right through me if I'd have been over six more inches. <laughs> <laughs> and, I, and I'm assuming that that's probably one of the more, um, uh, one of the more, uh, you know, challenging encounters that you had in basic. Like I'm assuming you didn't have any other events where you thought that you were in danger or anything oh, like that? Oh, uh, yeah, well, that was probably the closest that uh, encounter I ever had. But, you know, we were, they would have us out crawling under live machine gun fire at night. Hmm. And, and you could see tracer bullets. And uh, you would be crawling on your belly with your rifle, and those things would just hear, you'd hear them zing, zing, zing right over your head, you know, and every... Uh, once in a while there'd be a lighted tracer and boy, oh boy, they, uh, the uh, soldiers would be out there, the cadre, the trainers would be out on the sidelines when they were crawling under there and they were, they'd keep yelling constantly, keep your head down, keep your head down. And uh, you'd have your steel helmet on, you know, and boy, you'd have your nose right down into the dirt crawling. <laughs> and uh, and uh, that was, uh, that was, one of the more difficult procedures, wow. that was being prepared for the land invasion of Japan. I'd have been in on that without the atom bomb. It hadn't been for the atom bomb. So, so let's, let's talk about that really quick because that is another story that I remember you, you saying is that you went through basic and then if I remember it correctly, you were actually on your way across in 
you know, back then they had to they had to put you in rail cars, right, and get yeah. you to the coast. Right. And then once they got you to the coast, they had to put you on boats and get you right. on the ocean. Right. So it wasn't it was it was a very long journey to very get over there. Very much long. Yeah. As a matter of fact, <laughs> after our basic training, uh, you know, the war was over. The last day of our uh, the last day of my basic training was VJ Day, so the war was over. <laughs> and they didn't know what to do with all these soldiers. And we were finished with our basic training. So they gave us a delay in route where I could go back to Owain. That's the last time I saw my mother is when we went back to Owain there. And then uh, they were reassigning us to nine weeks of advanced infantry training in Fort Rucker, Alabama. Mm -hmm. So I go down to uh, Fort Rucker after that delay in route. You got about two weeks to get there, so that allowed you to go back to your home for a few days and visit all of your relatives, so, and then return to Fort Rucker. And so just to clarify, you, you actually, they dropped the bomb when you were still in basic? Yeah, yeah, okay. the bomb dropped when I was in basic. It was in August of 45. Wow, okay. And uh, we were completing our basic training right at that time right in August of 45. It kind of sounds like you're a man of timing, Grandpa. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I sort of so, well, that way. I'm you were six I inches away from the mortar. Earlier. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, I had close encounters. Close <laughs> encounters of the third kind or whatever they call <laughs> So, So now you make your way down to Alabama for yeah, down advanced, Alabama. advanced training. If we were going to have advanced infantry training, and we weren't there hardly two weeks, two to three weeks. And uh, it's hotter than heck. It's in early September, you know, and mm. it was hot. And uh, they took away all our summer clothing and gave us wool ID, wool OD clothing, olive drab. That was what it was called. OD was olive drab. And it was heavy wool clothing. And you had to wear those for a couple of days. And it was just hotter and so uncomfortable. Oh my God, can you think of walking around that heavy wool uh, stuff? But anyway, we did. And uh, then they put us on a troop train in Camp Rucker. And uh, they were shipping us to Camp Adair, Oregon. That's crisscrossing the United States from the southeast to the northwest. And we were on that train for six days. <coughs> getting going through all these little towns, you know, the damn train would sidetrack for everything that was coming down the rails. We were put, we were low priority, <laughs> so, yeah. and the train was probably, oh, about, I would say, twenty cars or something of soldiers, and there was a, a chow car, the dining car, right in the middle of it. And three times a day, we'd have to go through all these cars up to the child car to get our food and then return to where our assigned car was needed. <laughs> and while the train was moving, you know, you're going up there getting your food. And Try not back. to spill yeah. it. Yeah. And uh, so uh, we did that for six days. And wow. The train went up uh, to St. Louis and then on out to Denver and then up to Boise, Idaho, and then over to uh, uh, Portland, Oregon, and we were just south of Camp Adair, Oregon, and we stayed there for about three weeks. And then they put us on another train uh, to go up to Seattle, Fort Lawton, Seattle. And uh, we got to Fort Lawton, and uh, we could just tell we were getting prepared to be shipped overseas. And right before we were being ready to be shipped overseas, they called us out in a formation and uh, they said that uh, if any soldier enlists for a year's service from this day forward would get a week's uh, furlough to return to his home and enjoy a week and then be reassigned. Or you can get on this ship and you're going over to Japan, and I thought I'm not. So this some, is like you're going it was over. A choice to, to make, yeah. It, but you're going over to Japan for post World War II right. efforts occupation to help. duty. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. So anyway, um, 
uh, I said, well, I never volunteered for anything yet, and I'm not going to volunteer for this. I'll take my chances and go over to Japan. <laughs> so I, I had a choice. I could uh, go sign up for an extra year, and I said, I don't know what I'll be over there for, whether it be a year or five years or what, but anyway, I'll take my chances. And, so then if, if the plan was to have you over there for, or, or in the Army for three years, what they were saying is, we'll add another year to that, so you're committed to four years with yeah, us, basically. Yeah, that's kind of about what it amounted to, yeah. So you but took your way, I didn't sign up for it, because I was just home. I mean, you know, I returned to Alabama, where, but uh, six weeks ago I was just on mm. my uh, furlough home anyway. So anyway, uh, we went on to... Japan, and uh, and then you had to take the boat. You were on a boat, and you were sent right. over, right? Yeah. Do you remember how long that trip was? Yeah, it was about twenty-nine days. Wow. Yeah, it <laughs> was. It was uh, a long trip. You you kind of tell the army really didn't know what to do with you. The war was over. You know? <laughs> right. You were there, and it, it just seemed like uh, well, we don't know what the world to do with them, but we'll. Put them on a boat, and they can. <laughs> you will keep them, keep them guessing. <laughs> and so, we, at least make them think we know. Yeah, yeah, that's right. At least we think we know. But anyway, this little boat that we were on, there's only about 1,200 guys on it. It wasn't a very big boat. The hmm. Cape Victory was the name of it. Cape Victory. And uh, was. Do you remember what kind of boat it was? Yeah, it was. Uh, it was one manufactured for the uh, Navy for troop transport okay. and thing like that. And it carried about 1,200 soldiers. It so was not it, a big ship. It, it wasn't an aircraft carrier? No, it, it wasn't anything like that. It was, yeah. Did it even have any heavy equipment or it was just pure personnel? It was pure personnel. Okay. Yeah. We, down in the holds, uh, you slept in bunks about five high. Uh, the first, and there would be about bunks would be bolted on to a center post and so on, and you slept in uh, uh, those kind of uh, bunks that were attached to a big pillar and so on, yeah. and they were about five high, and uh, that's where you spent your time. And some guys were seasick the whole trip. Oh. <laughs> oh my gosh. <laughs> it was a mess. It was oh. the biggest mess I was ever in. <laughs> Did you get seasick? Well, I'll tell you what. I was seasick the one day, and I always remember the, the what? first day out of Seattle, everybody was just heaving up <laughs> over the sides of it. The ship was a mess. <laughs> you go down into the hold, you know, and they had these iron pipe rails to hang on to, and your hand would just slide down. <laughs> <laughs> Everything was, a, was a, a good, just a mess and stunk like hell. Oh. <laughs> and, and but anyway, the way I got over my seasickness is, is I was out there throwing up like everybody else, and this medic walks up to me, and he was in the Navy. It was a, these ships were manned by U.S. Navy, uh -huh. and he said, "I'll tell you how to get over." He said, "He says I'll." give you a couple of tablets, but he says the way you want to get over, he said, is just concentrate on regulating your breathing with the pitch of the ship. Uh -huh. And he'd say, now, when the ship goes down, inhale, and as it comes up on the other side, exhale. And he said, just re concentrate on your breathing with that rhythm. And he says, you'll get over your seasickness. And I did that, and I wasn't seasick for wow. another day. Yeah, but some guys were sick the whole damn trip. My wife and I do horrible on boats. You may have just saved us, Grandpa. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But um, I wasn't I wasn't seasick uh, for the rest of the trip. I just handled wow. well, and some guys were just they 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 couldn't go to bed without having their steel helmet beside them. You know, they yeah, came yeah. up and into their steel helmet. You know, and uh, it was just. Uh, just really a mess. <laughs> oh man! But uh, I, fortunately, I, I guess I found the secret for that just from that one sailor that told me how to do it, and uh, I wasn't seasick at all after that one day. Hopefully, you uh, bought him a candy bar. Yeah, I sure did. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I tell you what, the, the biggest treat on the whole trip was we left uh, Seattle 
right in apple season time. Uh. And um, the ship uh, had on a, a big shipment of apples, and they were delicious apples. And, and they would give us an apple every afternoon on that on that trip going over there, and everybody was waiting around to get an apple. <laughs> Could you believe that? <laughs> and that apple, <laughs> just uh, just such a great treat, you well, know, it was you, like having an ice cream soda. <laughs> you probably never got anything like that, you know, while you were in basic. Yeah, but... we didn't. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but these apples were just delicious, you know. And, I can imagine. And uh, it was just a real treat to get that apple every single day. And <clears throat> one day we were in a typhoon going across there. Wow. And uh, everybody was boated, you know, informed they had to stay in the hold. You couldn't go out on deck or anything. And God, I remember seeing that, uh, the wind, the winds were just, just enormous. And uh, the wind would come along and blow a hole in that ocean. It looked like a 40-story building could fit in. And the ship would just go down this way like that, and then up around like that. And God, <laughs> guys were sick and everything. And we didn't, what they did is uh, just turn the ship around because it couldn't go forward anymore. And that. just have to wait that storm out wow. until it blew, blew across before you turned around and went forward again. And the chip just sat there like a cork on the ocean, like <laughs> that, going up oh, and down God. and up. And the guys <laughs> were just in a mess with that. Oh, it man. was really something. But uh, we eventually, well, the first uh, place that we had to go to, we were ordered to, was Nagasaki. And that's where one of the atom bombs fell. Yeah. And uh, everybody was anxious to see what kind of damage the bomb did. So and that was the very, so from the ocean ride from Seattle, you immediately went there? To, see, to Nagasaki, yeah. So we got down to Nagasaki and it was just a nice beautiful day and everything and everybody was just clamoring to get off that ship because we've yeah. been on it for three weeks and uh, we were just clamoring to get off and the, the, the uh, ship just sat there in the bay there and all at once a motor, motor launch comes out with some uh, high military official reordering us to Nagoya. So that was another three-day trip from Nagasaki up to Nagoya. Nagasaki was on Kyushu Island, uh, the uh, southernmost island in Japan, and that was supposedly where we were supposed to be. But we were reordered to go up to Nagoya, which was on Honshu, the main island of Japan, where all the major cities are and so on. So we were on, it took another, wouldn't have taken three days, but they just didn't know what to do with you. <laughs> so, they, so they shipped us up to Nagoya. They, they, the, they told the captains of the boat, just go out a little bit, do a few circles. <laughs> yeah, and head up to Nagoya. Kill some time. Kill some time, that's exactly right. So we went up to Nagoya, and uh, we got off the boat at uh, Nagoya, and they put us in a replacement camp in, in, um, outside of Nagoya, a town called Okazaki. And um, uh, we were there uh, in Okazaki waiting for assignment to some unit there. The, all the other the soldiers that were originally in Japan at that time were all World War II vets that had been through the whole war, you know, and they put them up there to, as occupation troops, and then we were to come there to replace those guys so they could <coughs> ship back to the States and get discharged. Right. And uh, so um, we uh, went to uh, Nagoya, and I was assigned to um, uh, a A regimental headquarters unit in Nagoya. Headquarters 252, my address was Headquarters Detachment 259th Ordnance Battalion. And uh, so we uh, set up an ordnance depot in Nagoya, outside of Nagoya, and had all the equipment brought in trucks and tanks and all the military gear that you had to have. and, and uh, <coughs> we uh, just had it right there at uh, that ordnance depot. 
And and you used the word the earlier occupation, but what did what did you see yourself as as doing over there? And I know you said that you know it seemed like the the army was struggling to figure out what to do with you guys. But did you did you at least have some kind of sense of of purpose or? Or, you know, were you actually helping reconstruct homes and things? Or yeah, something? well, we weren't doing that. We were just there to occupy. They, they didn't have us assigned to any particular duties. We were just there to occupy and keep order in, the, in Japan. That's all we were doing. Because we didn't know how those people were going to react and, and accept us and all that sort mm -hmm. of thing. We were, some of, we were the first occupation troops in Nagoya there. And um, uh, the Japanese people turned out to be very friendly and most helpful in everything. They were, they were, you know, they knew that, hey, we meant business and they were there to uh, help and assist us. And, and they did. They, they, were, they were most respectful of us, Japanese people were. Did you ever get to meet any families or oh, yeah. anyone when you were yeah. there? Mm -hmm. Are, were there any particular moments that stood out to you that you can still remember? Well, um, not particularly. Uh, we used to, I was kind of a, a supply sergeant uh, that distributed supplies to the troops here. And every, every soldier was entitled to a carton of cigarettes a week. So not just a pack, but a uh, cart full carton, ten, full carton ten, of packs. ten packs to a carton, you know. <laughs> and they were entitled to uh, a bar of soap and a blanket. Of course, a blanket was uh, permanent, but like a you know, bar of soap a week and everything like that. And uh, I would have to issue those supplies and uh, to our unit there. And uh, then. Um, Another thing we were entitled to was uh, two, they looked like they were liter bottles, they were two liter bottles, two liters to a bottle of Japanese beer. Everybody liked Japanese beer, it had a rice base in it mm. and so on. And I'd have to go down to the Japanese brewery with the truck and, and get our units uh, allotment of beer and every soldier got two bottles of beer. Every Every week? week, every week, yeah. Okay. And these were, they, these just weren't like the bottles we have. They were, they looked like they were kind of half gallon bottles, like you know, so almost, half gallon milk. Is. Almost like a small jug, kind yeah, of. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah. right. That's what it was. So they got two of them. And they had two a week. Yeah. Wow. So they couldn't drink it all at once. <laughs> now, did you drink and smoke back then? No, I didn't. And but I tried to drink and smoke. <laughs> that you didn't like I it? Had my, my, my foot locker was backed up with cigarettes. <laughs> so what we would do, uh, we would jump in a Jeep on the, on the weekends, on usually a Sunday, and uh, we'd drive into the mountains and the Japanese people would buy those cigarettes from us for, give us 20 bucks a carton for them, which was a lot of money in those days. 20 bucks a carton for cigarettes. And uh, we, we and I would sell all my cigarettes. God, I had more money in Japan than I knew what to do with. <laughs> you couldn't spend it on anything. I carried my money around in a tobacco pouch. And there and it was <laughs> Japanese money. <laughs> I had so much <laughs> yen. They called it. Yeah. yeah. And uh, so we uh, uh, yeah, would do that every Sunday. And then one, this one little town that we would go to to sell those cigarettes, some dumb American soldier one time unsealed the carton of cigarettes, just melted the wax on the end and kind of pulled out and pulled out all the cigarettes and then stuffed it with tissue paper uh. and then sealed it back up and sold it to some Japanese guy for 20 bucks. And when we went in and found that out, boy, we went into that town the next time and they didn't want anything to do with us. <laughs> they, were, they really got taken, you know. They, one, one bad apple. Yeah, one nut would do something like that. You had such a good thing going for you, but some nut has to, you know, try to 
beat the system, you know. Right. And, that, and he ruined it for everybody. <laughs> so that's the last time we could go to that town. <laughs> but the Japanese people were very friendly. And uh, they would just do anything for you. And as a matter of fact, we, uh, when we first got there, John, it was something terrible. Those people were starving to death. They were not starving to death, but they were hungry. They didn't have adequate diet or anything there. And because they'd been bombed up, they used to tell me, they'd say, B-29, come every day, and bomb them, you know. And it, it, Nagoya was such a, uh, it was such an industrial city. It was a manufacturer of airplanes and tanks and everything. It was a big, in, it was Japan's third largest city. It was a big industrial center, manufactured war material. It makes sense that that's why the U.S. would... Yeah, <coughs> so it was a big after. target for, yeah. and that's where we were. And uh, the, um, uh, it was just such a, a, a big center. And uh, we would uh, take our stuff into the, to the little towns around there and the Japanese people would buy it, but they were, when we got there, the, the poor, Japanese people didn't have anything. We had a big central mess hall where everybody on the base ate in this mess hall three times a day. And uh, we had good food and everything, but you know, you wouldn't eat all of it. The, the light meat would be the fatty part of it and uh, all that sort of thing. And the Japanese people, before you would come out to wash out your mess gear and everything and put your stuff in the garbage, before you'd put it in the garbage, they'd just come and just beg you, could, could I take it and take their hands and your mess gear and put it in a little box, you know, and they'd eat your garbage that you wouldn't eat. Can you imagine that? But they did that. Before you could uh, wash out your mess gear. And uh, there, there was a lot of, lot of, poverty among those people in those days. But they were, and I always remember uh, <coughs> the colonel at our headquarters unit hired a Japanese girl to be his secretary. And she was a real lady. She, really, she was just impeccable in dress and manners and everything. Very very sophisticated, and her name was Michiko Kato, I remember Michiko Kato, and she was a pretty girl, and um, uh, she would come to work every day dressed in her Japanese garb, you know, with the, the typical Japanese lady, what they dressed in, mm -hmm. and she would just had you know, impeccable manners and everything else. and. Uh, she would visit with us, you know, and so on, and she spoke English. And uh, she'd come and she'd ask us, she'd say, well, what did you do over the weekend? <laughs> and, uh, oh, God, we were everywhere, you know, and talk with you. And, uh, and say, well, we'd go to the Japanese dance halls, and, and Michiko would say, Japanese dance hall girl, no good. <laughs> <laughs> That's what she <you> said. Because <laughs> she was such a lady. And she was, but the colonel, uh, she was the colonel's private secretary and everything of the base and everything. And everybody uh, respected her and liked her. She was just, you know, funny little things like uh, just <laughs> illustrated there. Like she just had impeccable manners. She was just the perfect lady, you know. <laughs> And she carried herself just that way too, you know, like. <laughs> but, uh, Do you remember, was she older than you then? Oh, you think? I would, yeah, like I was 19. Yeah. And uh, I would say, yeah, she was probably well into her 20s or something like She was a young lady. Oh, still, and, still uh, fairly young. I yeah. don't recall that she was married or anything like that. The Japanese people were quite family-oriented, and um, I don't recall that she was married or anything, but she would always be to work every single day, and her job was a colonel secretary. That's 
who she worked for. Hmm. And uh, but we could all talk with her, and during a break time or something, I was in the supply room downstairs, you know, and and uh, and uh, I and another guy, Malcolm Logelman was his name. Uh, she would always come down and visit with us for a few minutes on her break and so on, and go to the mail. We had a big mail room there too for the whole base, and she. She just circulated around, you know, and she just a, she was a real nice lady, was what she was, and she was probably in her twenties, and I was nineteen when I was over there. So how long were you in Japan? Just about six months. And then you went back to states. Yeah, um, the way that happened, um, uh, one day there after I'd been there six months. Word came down through all the various uh, communication systems that I was to return to the United States on the first available transportation. And I didn't. So my mother used to write me a letter every single day I was in the service. Every day I would get a letter from my mother. And I was continuing to get these letters, you know, and so on. And then this word comes down. You have to adjust that a little bit. There we go. Sorry about that. Oh, that's okay. Yep, you should be good now. Okay. Well, then the word comes down that I'm to return to the United States on the first available transportation. And I couldn't figure out why, why is this? How come? What? What happened? And, and no word at all. Nobody knew anything. Just the direction was there that I was to return to the first available transportation. And the colonel said, well, Johnny says you would have to take the train up to Tokyo this afternoon. So get your gear all packed and everything. Be on that train. This is what my order says you're to do. So I go up to... Um, do that, get on, packed up, and say goodbye to all the guys. And you know, you've known these guys now for a few months. They were just like brothers Sorry, to you. I'm not sure. Huh. Oh, is that? Oh, Alexa. Yeah, that's it. Okay, we're good. Okay. <laughs> yeah, Alexa's taking all this down too. This, yeah. this, that was not my fault. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But anyway, I go up to um, Tokyo. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm put uh, up in this hotel right next to General MacArthur's headquarters. And his headquarters was in a very famous building there in Tokyo called the Daiichi Building. And I'm in this hotel right next to him waiting for orders to be assigned to a flight to return to the States. So. Um, I was there for about five or six days, and every morning I, I could look down on that plaza to the Daiichi building, just look right down on the scene there, and the Japanese people would be lined up there, lined up all oh, by the hundreds, and MPs would be there patrolling the place, holding them back and everything, and MacArthur would come up in his limousine about 8 o'clock in the morning and from his car walk into the Daiichi building. And as he was walking in, the people would be cheering him and clapping and just messages of adoration toward him. Hmm. And uh, he'd walk in there. Then at 5 o'clock at night, the same scene would happen where he would return to wherever he was staying, uh, the limo would pull up and MacArthur would walk out and the Japanese people again would be lined up every day. That was a ritual. All those five days I was there, they'd be did you ever, MacArthur. What? Did you ever find out the the background? The well, it's story? just that he was such an admired person. He was a hero. Huh. The, he was a hero to the Japanese people, like the, the Japanese people never knew what an eight-hour workday was in a five-day work week. <laughs> they just were working like 
fool was uh, all the time they were there. And MacArthur brought some social order to the country. Ah. And uh, he, he was recognized not in so much as a conqueror, but as a, a savior <laughs> to the Japanese people. Interesting. Yeah. And they were just cheering him every day. They'd be down there cheering him. And of course, this was right after the war. I don't know how long that kept up, like huh. 20 years or what. But for, for five years, because he was there only five years. But at any rate, um, I was, uh, that was a scene that I would look upon every day in this hotel that I was at. And then eventually I got my orders to go out to Atsugi Airfield and, and uh, I was assigned a flight to return to the United States. And that flight um, uh, took off from Tokyo and we flew to Guam. And Guam was straight south of Tokyo. And it took us eight hours to get to Guam. It was about 1,600 miles. That'd be about like here to Kansas City or something like that. And it took us eight hours to get there. They're all prop planes. And then the next flight was from Guam to Kwajalein, which was a little island only about a <laughs> mile by mile, just enough big, for a landing big, strip. Just about. big enough for an airport, That's for an airplane. Right, yeah. <laughs> and that was a long flight from, uh, from Guam to Kwajalein. And Kwajalein was one of the uh, uh, islands that saw quite a bit of the war. I mean, it was Japanese people or Japanese soldiers were quartered there and everything, and they had to be taken over uh. to the war. And then, and then from Kwajalein, we went to Johnston Island, which was another eight hours away. And uh, <clears throat> Johnston. Uh, the plane would just sit down there and it had to be refueled and rechecked out and everything. Uh, these were the various steps that it went to. And then from Johnston we went up to uh, Pearl Harbor in Hawaii. And then the longest flight was from uh, Pearl Harbor to uh, Hamilton Field in San Francisco. That was a 12-hour flight. What did, what, do you remember what, you know, any of those so you said like the one island was was war torn, but you know Pearl Harbor had been bombed. And yeah. Well, were there were there like obvious signs of? Uh, no, no. See, it was four years later, forty one okay. to forty five. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. See, so it was all you know it was pretty well civilized back in decent order and so on. All the buildings that you didn't see much war destruction. You saw war destruction in Japan. Right. Like our base was all torn up, something terrible. But on these islands, as we came across, it's you know, it's years later, and uh, there wasn't much war damage that we could see at all. <coughs> and, and then I, uh, I never knew why I was going home, you know. So you make it to San Francisco, right? And all you know is somebody told you to go here, but you yeah, still don't know. And I don't know why I'm going. <laughs> <laughs> well, so I call up my home, and uh, my sister Lorinda uh, uh, answered the phone, and I said, "Well, what are you doing there?" Uh, she never lived with us at all, but she was at the home there, and she says, "Well, haven't you heard?" I said, "No, I haven't heard anything. I don't know why I'm here at all." And she says, "Well, your mother died." I said, for crying out loud, yeah, that, that's the first I learned while I was going back, that my mother passed away. And uh, she said that they arranged for you to get an emergency furlough. And uh, so that's why. And then it took me another two days. I had to go by train then from San Francisco uh, over to Kansas City and then uh, to Kansas City on our Great Western Railroad up to Owain. It took two, two day, two to three days to do that. <laughs> you had to go by train then. <laughs> so that's why I came back was 
somebody arranged, I think it was my uncle uh, Clement, he was quite a, on the draft board and so on, and I think he arranged to have you flown back, but he should not have done that. There's nothing he could do anyway. But anyway, he did. And then I had a 30-day furlough uh, in O-Line there. <coughs> and then I was reassigned to um, Aberdeen Proving Ground in Maryland. So after that, I jumped on a train and go into Chicago and then go to another railroad station and get on a train that takes us all the way to Aberdeen Proving Ground. It went through uh, uh, Pittsburgh and, and uh, well, most of the major cities in Indiana and Ohio. But anyway, I, it's the first time I'd ever been in that part of the country. Uh, I got off in Aberdeen Proving Ground, and then I was assigned uh, uh, as a supply sergeant to a training group there, training new recruits and so on at Aberdeen Proving Ground. And I did that for six months, and then I was discharged on October 12, 1946. Yeah, 1946. And then is that when you went into college at that point? No, no. <clears throat> See, the school fall semester had already started. Oh, sure, yeah, October. you would be in the middle of it. Yeah. Yeah. So I came back to Owain and, and I took a route uh, as a dry cleaning route person where you go to all these little towns around old wine, you know, I had three different routes. <laughs> and uh, pick up dry cleaning and bring it back. Uh, and, uh, Mondays and Thursdays I had a route, Tuesdays and Fridays I had a route, and Wednesdays and thir Fridays I had a route. Wednesdays and Saturdays rather, Saturdays, six days a week, yeah. And I would um, uh, pick up dry cleaning, deliver it back, and just keep on picking it up. It was just a rotation kind of business. Uh, dry cleaning was pretty big in those days. And, you know, and I didn't have a salary. I just, it was a commission job. And I just saved up money from commissions on it. I think I got 20% or something like that. And um, I saved up money and then I went to college. Okay. In 1947. Yeah. And um, do you want to keep, we've been going for just a little over an hour. Do you want to take a quick break or do you want to keep keep talking? We might as well keep talking. All right. <laughs> I, I can, I, I can talk with the best of them, Grandpa. Okay. So. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you sure can. Yeah. So I, as, as can, long as you're okay. I can keep babbling on. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And which, so which college did you go to? Well, I started out, I thought I would be interested in uh, engineering. Okay. And I went to Iowa State. Yep, in Ames, Iowa. In Ames, yeah. Yep. And I got down there and got into those courses, and, and I just didn't like it at all. And what kind of engineering would that have been? That would have been civil, civil? Engineering, civil yeah. engineering. Civil engineering. And yeah. I didn't like the chemistry and the science and all that sort of thing that we were doing. And the lettering, I wasn't a good letter you had to have impeccable printing in engineering you know interesting yeah, yeah you just it just had to be impeccable and uh, <laughs> so I just didn't like that at all so uh, after uh, I was there for a couple of months I had finished out the semester and I, I had passable grades but then I I thought well Omaha isn't just another 150 miles away. I think I'll apply at Creighton and to their business school for I sent to the literature to the College of Commerce. And they sent to me, so I applied there and they took me in. And, and uh, I just had a, a economics and finance education major at Creighton University. And was that what the degree was called, or were those yeah. two separate degrees? No, they were the economics and finance okay. was together. Yeah, I had both degrees. Yeah, mm -hmm. and and I enjoyed that because I enjoyed uh, uh, economic issues. You know, like uh, all the things that government does and everything. And I like 
I like economic subjects and where do you arguments think, and so on. Where do you think that interest came from? Were you reading a lot of newspapers? I think so. And like maybe maybe when you were on all those travels and all those train yeah, rides? I think that's part of it there too. And I always remember this, John. When uh -huh. we're back in high school, um, the Rotary Club or some fraternal club in Owain there asked all the students to write a paper of only 150 words on the subject of why national unity was important to my country. That was the subject. You had to write why national unity was important to my country. And I wrote a paper and I got first place. <laughs> <laughs> and this was between our two high schools and O-line. <laughs> so I'm, I'm not going to ask you to recount from memory all 150 words. Yeah. But, <laughs> but, but do you remember a couple of the themes yeah. that you decided to write about? Yeah, exactly. I think so. Uh, and basically, uh, it was because we were coming up to World War II. Right. And uh, the threats of uh, Nazism in Germany, in Europe, and uh, the coming of a war there, uh, the fact that, hey, this is getting closer to our country, and we have to have a, a good national unity approach to this problem because it's a growing issue and is, it's getting closer to our shores. And you could just have it for 150 words. And why national unity is important to our country. And those were the kind of the themes I built the uh, paper around. Mm. Is that? And I got first place. <laughs> <laughs> I still got the medal. I just looked at it the other really? day. Really? Yeah. Uh -huh. <laughs> and the American Legion sponsored the thing. You know? Okay. And uh, I got a medal for that at graduation. And but uh, I was always kind of interested in economic subjects, you know, yeah. and what makes an economy run and turn and so on. So in terms of economics, there's a, were you, are you more, more interested in, um, you know, how business and organizational changes will affect uh, various things? Because there, there's mm -hmm. economies of, of other areas now as well, right? Yeah. Like economies of human behavior and things. Yeah. I was. I was always interested in the business aspect of the economy. I, I really was. And, and the government side of it too. As a matter of fact, I took a, a course, a college course, uh, government and business. And um, it, it just had to dealt with government's involvement in, in business. And, you know, with all the government agencies that were founded just to to regulate and assure that business could could prevail in a in a in a decent, honest way. Mm -hmm. That's what it was, and and uh, I always liked business. That was always uh, a big thing that I liked about being. As a matter of fact, the first job I got out of college <coughs> was. Um, with Peter Kiewit's son's company in Omaha, and they were a national construction firm. And uh, I didn't, I, I stayed there for a few years, but I didn't like it because, well, I didn't dislike it, but I mean, the, the, there was nothing there that broadened me. Mm -hmm. There was no contact with the outside. It was just so in, intercompany uh, structured that all you knew about was Peter Kiewit, which was good. No, nothing wrong with that. And, you know, I probably could have stayed there and made a career. But I wanted something broader. So I went to work for a smaller company where I had contact with the marketplace and with bankers and, hmm. and even, even lawyers and structuring conditional sales contracts and things like that and rental contracts and leases and things of, you know, that real business subjects. And I enjoyed that so much more because it broadened me out and gave me experience in, in how, how a marketplace really works. Yeah. <laughs> well, and I'm, I wonder how much of this goes back to your childhood as well with your mom running the grocery store. You yeah. know, do you think parts of her 
of the business side of what she dealt with, maybe maybe you got to experience some of that. Exactly. Yes, you know something. My mother, running her grocery store, had to sell groceries on credit. It wasn't a cash business in those days. All, All right. the grocery stores kind of did that, and um, there'd be a lot of people that wouldn't pay her. Uh, you know. They, they, they just were slow in paying. They'd get their paychecks and so on and do them with other things. And, and my mother would ask me if I would go around to the, there's about four or five or six <laughs> different families that were slow on paying for their groceries. They'd come and buy their groceries, but then when their paychecks came in, they w wouldn't always pay you. So uh, she would ask me if I would go, and I said, sure, I'll do that. And I went around to, four or five different customers and say, hey, you got to pay for your groceries. My mother is giving you credit so you can have food on the table. Now I want to be paid, we want to be paid for it. And I would do that. <laughs> can you imagine? How old were you? I was probably in high school. Gosh. Even in high school hardly. I, I couldn't imagine I doing that, that at my she age. would ask me if I would do that. And I said, sure, I'll do that. <sighs> I remember this one guy, Hugh McGee, it was his name, and he always owed her money. And, and wouldn't you pay her, and I'd go and, and just tell her not to worry, I'll pay her. And I said, well, she needs the money now. <laughs> she doesn't want a promise that you're going to pay it someday. She needs it now. <laughs> she has to replenish your inventory that you <laughs> took out by uh, buying buying these groceries on credit. Now she wants to be paid so she can replenish that inventory. <laughs> in, in my head, I'm starting to develop this picture of Grandpa in this like black, you know, really straight suit with a baseball bat coming up to this guy. That's about right. <laughs> yeah. I wasn't a very big kid, though. <laughs> I'd, I'd have to have the bat because I couldn't defend myself. I remember this Hugh McGee telling me, well, tell her not to worry, I'll pay her. And I said, well, she needs it now. She, 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 she gave you the food. She, she, when you wanted your food, she didn't say, well, tell her to, you'll have to wait. I'll get it to you someday. You wanted it right now. Well, we want the money right now. That's a pretty good argument. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's a compelling argument. I think yeah. you, would, you would win me over. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but my mother had a tough life, John. Yeah. She really had a tough life. And she was such a good woman, and uh, she uh, she could just visit with the best of them. And she had a strong democratic background, and she was a great Roosevelt person. And uh, uh, people really respected her and liked her for what she was up against and raising two baby boys. Uh, uh, just on her own, you know, out of that grocery store, and and, uh, and we had a lot of relatives around town in those days too, like uh, the Crayon family. Did I show you the Crayon family picture? Mm -mm. Oh, I got to show you. Yeah, you want to? Here, let's let's pause for that. Okay. And we'll, we had we'll a lot of family it. around town. <laughs> 